you for coming to the service concept session. Um, everything that you say here is going to be used to inform the operating model that you're working at. Um, so um, as much as you can challenge these ideas as much as possible, that's what we're looking for today. Um, so I'll just give you a wee overview in terms of what the project's about. Um, can you still hear me if I stand out in front? Um, so essentially the operating model is what are the functions that we uh, need to do from the tweaking perspective and what are the capabilities that we need in order to do those functions. That's what our operating model is going to be. There's another piece of work um, a bit further down in terms of how do we do it. We're not concentrating on the how just yet. So when you see these service concepts and you go, oh, how are you going to make that happen? We want to know that they're a good idea first and then we'll work out the how. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you on to Max, who is our wonderful co-design specialist who's been working on these service concepts. And just, just to give you a bit of a background on them, so there's been a whole bunch of research that's gone into these. We um, did a bit of research right across the country with our learners, um, trying to understand what are the barriers and the enablers for them in terms of the education. And we also did the same with employers. So what you what you see in terms of these service concepts is basically what they say are the unmet needs. So you might look at these service concepts and you might say something like this already exists and it may well do, but what they're saying to us is these are their unmet needs. So we need to put them up and then them challenged. <coughs> Challenge them as much as possible to, to make sure that by the time we get to the end of this process, we've got something that we think really is innovative and pushes the boat out as much as we need to to reimagine the future of vocational education. So Max Adler here, our co-design specialist, he's going to take you through the workshop today. Thank you. Kia ora koutou katoa. Um, thank you so much, Hila. Uh, so I think she said most of what I wanted to say, <laughs> so I'll make this brief. Um, but for us, these concepts really are like uh, making a paper boat, putting it out on a pond and seeing what happens. Yeah, so with the first draft, what you'll see, um, we've already been in three weeks of feedback around the country, um, partly online through a citizen led platform, which is a not online engagement tool, which you have access to, uh, but also in employer workshops, we've seen 19 employers so far in workshops, uh, index interviews with employers and learners, and, uh, and meetings with interest groups. For example, the Pacifica Working Group from, from Pukin and from the network itself. So we've done that work so far, and it's ongoing, and we have a period of engagement which was mentioned by Hila earlier, a roadshow in June, where there will be a further chance to look both at the um, revisions to these concepts and how they tie into the operating model. And if you imagine, um, the way I think about it is we're starting with the experience of, or the, the desired experience um, for learners and employers, and then we work backwards from that. So the top layer is that experience that people will have in the future, underneath it is how do we enable it. Um, so you have a chance to look at those today and go, yeah, this is a good idea or it's not a good idea, and this is why. We'd love to get any um, key thoughts from you. We, once you've posted a few ideas on the wall, a few responses, we'd love to get some key thoughts from you, key impressions, when we come back to sit down together. Um, I'll just give you a bit of an overview. Those are the seven concepts. As, um, as Heather says, uh, they're based on research done last year. With, um, with learners across the country, but then also um, reflections with the industry training organisations, and then now the experience um, that we're gathering from employers in response to these. Uh, that first one there is, is a good one to look at. If you don't see anything else, take a look at that one. It's kind of a, an underpinning concept which um, works across the sector. So it's something that Tapuki will need to work with the RSLGs and the WDCs on, and the NZQA. So it's a whole of sector sort of notion. And some parts of that already exist, um, like for example, careers planning and that new solution that's being rolled out next week. Um, I think that's probably all I need to, to say at this point. Um, anything that you do say in this meeting will be useful over the next couple of weeks as we write our revisions. Um, in May will be to bring those revisions back to publish on that, uh, on that digital platform that I mentioned, the Citizen Lab. If you just wanted to Google Citizen Lab and Tapukina, you will find it. And you can go there and you can post comments in detail. 
All right. Kevin, do you think there's anything else I should um, should say? I think the only the only thing is that um, this isn't this isn't a whole operating model. Um, so, for instance, there's also there's already some really good stuff happening in the sector. It's not we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We are not looking at replacing quality education with the service concepts. All of those things will still remain. These are the, the added uh, value, if you like. These are what these are what these ideas are. Yeah, we're asked to sort of push the boundary and be bold. And it's been bold around the unmet needs. What people are saying is not currently met. So there's a whole lot of good stuff that works. We're not touching that. This is about pushing the boundary and the things that people are saying there's no response for, no solution for at the moment, or only in part. Yep, so that's, that's the function of these concepts. So what I'd love to invite you to do before we come back and sit down together, and how much time do we have remaining? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, cool. So if you want to take um, 10 minutes to go to the wall, and um, take a read of things on there that interest you. So maybe take a look at this and go, I'm really keen to look at, you know, um, employer and learner cooperatives. What does that mean? Or uh, Matauranga Innovation Hubs. So I'll go and take a look at that on the wall and I'll post a thought and then come back in about 10 minutes' time. Really appreciate it if you could do that. Thank you. Feel free to stand where you are actually if you want to shout your question or an impression from the floor, you don't have to take a seat. But I'm here to um to answer anything or to add any information you may need. Just to recognise those concepts, um those are pretty much the summaries on the wall. Um, and the detail is on that Citizen Lab site. Uh, just to reiterate, someone's already gone in to see that actually comments are closed as of um, Anzac Monday, but they're open again in June. I should have made that point. So that um, platform will open again in June. But anyone got any um, any thoughts they want to share? Any questions in particular that I might be able to help with? Well, it may not be able to help, but this week I was talking to Julia talking about um, from, uh, in the secondary school, for instance, getting um, kids on the career path. Yeah. I talked about, um, it seems like that, it's almost like corralling kids into one career. That seems to be the, I guess, the, the focus. And the kids are actually going to take a certain number of subjects and you can only go into a certain number of careers where um, they are going to like the whole bowl of meat. They're sort of going to go through maybe five or six different industries, yeah. maybe seven jobs that these kids are going to go through. But you know, plenty of different jobs and team industries, so it seems to be counterproductive what we talk about there. When they get to the skills framework, um, as opposed to what's being taught in school to prepare kids in the secondary school, mm. which almost cuts off your options if your kids don't ask and they want to go do engineering at the university. Um, does that? Um, yeah, it's, that's a, it's a great point because yeah. this, this class I've been talking about the kids and for anyone new stage of their learning. So they can see, um, they can see that there's actually a plethora of options open to them. The issue with this, and one of the challenges with this concept is, if the world is your oyster in terms of learning, if you have anywhere for provision, then how do you accredit that provider so you've got confidence around quality? So we know that's a challenge with this concept. So we want to be bold about that. We want to the feedback from employers and learners whilst their qualifications are too rigid, and we need other ways to to um, recognise what we know and we can what we're learning, so we can then transfer that into other career options. Yeah. Are you going to have influence with providers over international students, or is that, is that part of your remit, or not? Well, yeah. whatever that might look like? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I'm a little bit lost as well. Um, with, in terms of the, where, where does the grouping sit in terms of the WDCs, the RSLG, Great question. all the other? Yeah, that's right. So, so, so that concept there does rely on cooperation. We already heard about WBCs sort of signing off on programs in order to attract funding. Their funding. So, what does it mean then for this concept where potentially uh, employers are grouping together locally to say, we want a foundational skills course, we want that recommended? So, how does that fit in the WBC role? So, those are good questions. So what the two thing is, it's the current Polytechnics Institute of Technology plus those um, industry training organisations that are joining. 
by which is still a national aim of discrimination. Does that would be one of the major problems as well that just to, um, I'm sorry if I don't know that you were talking about um, how we, um, you know, there's pigeonholing, hold, uh, pigeonholing of jobs or sectors and then the thing is that it's not just the education system or telling us that we need to go into learning this to get this sector, we've also got the problem of the competition. So the industries are blatantly competing against each other and so they'll roll out the market employees just like to go to tourism up in Auckland at the present moment and they'll roll out the market employees of which everyone's got the biggest budget for the biggest marketing plan is actually capturing these children and telling them that we've been in a system forever that I actually was hoping would change after lockdown but it certainly hasn't so it's nice to see things like this but forever we're um, you know we are being told what it is we want to do rather than we are telling you what it is we want to be. Um, so, yeah, so, I, I mean, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Mm, just follow on from that. Yeah, I just want to recognise everyone. That's a really key point to this. This is as much about identity and self um, recognition as it is about fitting uh, job skills that are currently in market. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just following on from that, you have a group of learners who demand who are teaching and assessment of virtual reality, which is what's out there. But learners choosing what they want to learn and how they want to be assessed are the ideas. Uh, how do learners dictate them and WDCs are the ones that decide whether programs get funded? Yes. So uh, you've got a group of learners who want to learn about becoming uh, Instagram influencers, and there's huge demand for that learning, and that given none of the WDCs uh, they want to endorse a program yes. which, uh, which uh, funds that type of learning. Yes. So, so I just want to recognise your question. I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the problems I think with kids in high school is they don't know what they don't know. So <laughs> it's giving them the opportunity <laughs> to try things. Mm -hmm. So I think you did right. You know, whether it's a big marketing scheme or whether they're getting told they have to do science or whether they're going to close up their options. You see there being opportunities to integrate more with schools or to give more opportunities for kids to just try stuff. I mean, the dual enrolment program and the secondary tertiary data has been hugely successful in some areas. But could you expand, or maybe even do bite size chunks of that, yeah. to give kids a chance to say, I thought I was going to like that, I don't like that, now I'm going to have time to try something else? Yeah, it's, it's another good question, and, and it, it's going to go to what the operating model is, because what does it mean for the people to be potentially working more in and with secondary schools yeah. and even primary schools? What does that actually mean? Because some of these imply, like you say, you know, if um, there's no reason why a secondary school student shouldn't have access to, or have access to their own learner record, but in addition to that, be able to um, think about where they want to go in terms of career options, and even careers that aren't onshore yet, but maybe offshore or in development, and then go, so how might I get a taste of that experience, and then connect up with what the PUCA has offered, you know? That's it's also, also the place. Now. It's also understanding that sort of historical high school environment. I mean, it's all great doing stuff in primary school. I think as I'm saying, it's, you know, kids are really creative in primary school. They come to high school and they, they look at all the creative and they just have a box. So, pathway. Well, we know it's kind of blowing the path of the high school level to enable that engagement. And that's a ministry that I mean, this is not good. But in order for the whole chain to work, it would be really nice to have those options. One thing that's come through clear in the feedback we've got too is that we don't want to drive a wedge between academic and vocational education like it is now. We don't want to make that wedge deeper and wider. We're trying to bring that closer. So why should kids in high school somehow get the impression that that actually learning on the job in relation to practical skills is somehow a lesser path for learning? You know, so we need to somehow break that one down. Well, I remember when I left school at 16, and um, now I'm turning 40 this year. I my own aviation company, started in Kiwis, been going 10 years, um, traveled the whole world jumping for 20 years. Yeah. And at 16, like, the options for me were the meatworks, the dairy industry, or some um, trade that I, that I would settle for just because I've been told I should have a job. Um, seemingly, like 20 years later, the same options for someone that's leaving school are the meatworks, the dairy industry, or the trade that's something that's going to settle for because. Um, they need to have a job because you know they're not in a or their family, which my parents weren't. Um, they're not in a um, a category or a 
or a place where they actually are going to have access to the um, financial educational system to be able to do anything like university. Um, but then when they talked me back into coming in three days a week or two days a week to a STEM form employment research course, that was two days a week um, for three to four hours in the classroom learning um, and just, you know, skills for how to be in an um, interview, how to write a CV, etc. And then three days a week for three week periods doing work experience at a whatever industry that you chose, you know. So I managed to do surf shop and retail, I did um, uh, chefing and a couple of other things. So then why was, you know, why would that only be offered to when you're at that point? Now you're going to be leaving and now, so it's a very quick rush thing when you could introduce that either at a primary level or at the start of the um, high school level as well. So maybe that's an yeah. example. Yeah, it's a good yeah. example. Thank you. Yeah, cool. All right. Any Got any, any time here? Yeah. 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 And, and my understanding is that the, the politics traditionally have no experience with the role of, of pastoral care for students, at least not very intensively. How is that going to be resourced and funded? Yeah, so some of the polytechnics do this, and I know they do, so we're working with some. We have some people who are working in our COVID-19 who actually are, they're really active in that space, right? It might be around Pacifica Limited in particular, but they definitely have focuses like that. So I think it is about picking that up and understanding how to make it consistent across the network. And the question of resources is that next, next question we're asking. But that's be a real world to take. And if you do some things to scale and speed with the right data, but we also need people to provide services. So how does that work? Just on that point as well, just to keep in mind is that you will need to be monitoring thousands of students on a real time basis. And that brings me to the question on a lot of issues around data data sovereignty and data sovereignty, but I'd see it actually discussed here like yours, and that, you know, we are using technology like this, we're reducing people down to these points of engagement and blah, 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 as opposed to do you actually know it? Because I know the heart of data know it, but then that has to be a balance with it. Thank you. And just on that, I mean, alongside the offering model, there's a Thanks very much. Appreciate it.